coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. I think the other big trend that's happening right now is monetization. I think as the audience, and I felt this way for many years, as the overall audience, listening audience grows in podcasting, the monetization opportunities should correspond and grow as well. And I think we're starting to see the beginnings of that around what's called programmatic advertising, which is more auction-based, more automatic buys. You buy on a platform as a brand and then you run the campaigns and it automatically goes into podcasts based on that genre, Phil. And you can run real-time campaigns in podcasts, which has always been able to be done in streaming radio. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 125 of passion struck. And thank you to each and every one of you who comes back weekly to listen and learn how to live better, be better and impact the world. And if you didn't catch last week's episodes, I interviewed Dr. David Vago, one of the foremost experts in the world on meditation and how meditation can be used to promote health outcomes, transcendence, and meta-awareness. In my solo episode, I discussed why it is so difficult today to find the proper balance and eight ways that you can take action in your own life. And tomorrow we have a special bonus episode with 12-year-old animal conservationist, Kate Gilman Williams. She is a fireball of energy and you don't want to miss that episode. Now let's talk about today's guest, podcast Hall of Famer, Robert Greenley. Rob is the VP of Content and Partnership at Lipson. He is a current board member and former chair of the Podcast Academy. He started on radio in 1999 and in podcasting in 2004. I wish I would have started that early. And that first podcast was the first nationally syndicated radio show called Web Talk World Radio Show. Rob and fellow Podcast Hall of Fame inductee Todd Cochran host the new media show where they interview luminaries from the podcasting space, providing deep insight into what is actually happening in the podcasting world. In today's discussion, we go into how Rob launched his first radio show that I mentioned earlier, which later became his first podcast. His tenure at Microsoft working on their podcast strategy and products, why he thinks Microsoft entered too early and got out too soon, the reason that podcasting became his passion, what he sees are the biggest trends that are happening in the world of podcasting and what will come about over the next few years, the advent of video in podcasting and where he predicts the future of that and also live videos is going. It was such a pleasure to get to interview Rob and meet one of my podcasting idols. Thank you for choosing podcasting passion struck and choosing me to be your host and guide on your journey to creating an intentional life. Now, let that journey begin. So excited to welcome podcast Hall of Famer, Rob Greenley to the Passion Struck Podcast. Welcome, Rob. It's great to be here, John. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Yes. Well, I've uh, heard so much about you from a mutual friend of ours, uh, uh, Kate Shinakis. So I'm um, really glad she made that introduction and that I can expose one of the first people who was actually in the podcasting industry, you know, all the way back 15, 16 years ago um, to the show. So very, very honored to have you. It's great to be here. I actually, I started on the radio. So it's been for, for, for me and how I think about it, it's almost close to 20 years now. Yeah. Well, I've got a interesting similarity to you. We mm -hmm. both have been around companies called WebTalk. Um, I was actually a board member for seven years for a company called uh, WebTalk, which does mm -hmm. social CRM. They've got oh, probably at this yeah, point- I think I have heard of that before, yeah. Yeah, eight or nine million people on their platform. Mm -hmm. um, but WebTalk was the name of your first show, if I've got that correct. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it, it actually started out as Web Talk Guys because it was basically a group of co-hosts. So it was myself leading the show and I had like four or five co-hosts, not five, I think it was more like four. Um, and so it was a, kind of like a group talk about the growth and development of the World Wide Web and the internet. And then it evolved into Web Talk Radio. Uh, and then it was kind of more pared down to just um, me and and my uh, ex-wife, um, did the show together for six years. So, yeah. Yeah. And how did you come up with that name? Well, back in those days, and when I started this was back in 1999. So in that time frame, the web was kind of the cutting edge, right, of what was happening with technology at that time. And, and so that was kind of the the focus of what the show was about was talking about the growth and development of the World Wide Web and the internet. And so that was the topic of it. And so that's why I talk about, I use that name, um, was to kind of symbolize that, that, that period of time when, when what was happening with browsers and email and, and, you know, online connections and stuff was really starting to really lift off and become something significant in people's lives. And a lot of people, not unlike what's happening with crypto right now, um, uh, there's a lot of confusion and misunderstanding and um, just lack of understanding of um, what was happening with technology. And that's that's uh, certainly uh, what we tried to cover with that show, but it actually spanned the whole spectrum from talking about wireless access to cable access, fiber access, to um, what was happening more on the culture side too with um, movies and TV shows and things like that. Like I had uh, some of the stars from the X-Files on the show and and uh, uh, leaders like the fellow that created the the Wikipedia platform was on the show very early. And, and so it was just trying to cover at the cutting edge of what was happening with um, the changes that the internet was bringing, helping people understand what was coming and kind of had a future looking lens on it. And, and we talked a lot about wireless access um, for a long time, way before it actually uh, really became what it is today, basically ubiquitous um, across all of our experiences in life right now. It's pretty <laughs> much, I had no idea back then how profound of a shift that was going to bring to culture and society. Um, it, it just, it's gone way far beyond anything that I, I even talked about on the show. I think it was just more, I was saying that, you know, mobile phones were coming with wireless access because I was playing around with them with, with that kind of stuff more with Wi-Fi back then. Um, but it was, it, it's just amazing um, how much of a, a change that that's caused the, the world and all of our lives. It's interesting, um, back in the early 90s when I graduated, um, the Naval Academy, I worked for the NSA and mm. we were using mm. one of the very first versions of the internet back then, but it was all around encrypted uh, communications, but you could still send mm. the equivalent of an email. Um, but I would tell people about it because the, the system itself wasn't classified and people couldn't mm. wrap their head around, you're doing what? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting how on a short period of time, relatively so much has changed and the adoption oh. has become so great. A few years um, after that, um, I worked for Dell and I happened mm -hmm. to be there at the same time you were with Microsoft, um, who was one of Dell's uh, tightest partners. Partners, right, um, yeah. I actually got to meet uh, Steve Ballmer uh, multiple occasions um, on his visits mm -hmm. to, to Round Rock. Um, but you were, again, on the early days of Microsoft looking at podcasting, and I kind of wanted to understand more about what that experience was like. And then I guess the second part would be, why don't we see Microsoft today up there like Spotify and some of the other big entities, Apple, who are dominating the industry right now? Yeah, I think it's a complicated story um, just because... I think you have to transport yourself back to that time and how the market was developing and, and how, how media, um, digital media was evolving um, online as well. And, you know, you had, I think the big driver of it was Apple. Uh, I think uh, Microsoft saw Apple as their, their primary competitor. Um, 
and was really trying to compete directly with the popularity of the iPod back in the early days. My, Microsoft has always had this ambition to get involved in mobile. Um, they, they were a very early creator of mobile devices, whether it be the pocket PC or tablets or mobile phones, frankly. And they just never got it quite right. The timing of what they were doing was always a little off, but but they launched what was called the Zoom um, platform back in 2006, I think is when they launched that. I uh, That was basically a portable media player that basically competed directly with the iPod, uh, which had gained significant market share back then. And and I think to some degree, App, uh, Microsoft always had kind of Apple envy to some degree about wanting to um, be able to be as cool as Apple and have the popularity of their their devices and their tools. And I think that's kind of like a common thread that's that's um, been around Microsoft in combination with Apple for, for many years. And you can see um, pieces of that over a long time frame. But um, but they launched the Zoom and and I joined the team to um, to run the podcast area uh, because Zoom initially launched as a music platform, obviously to compete with the iPod and iTunes. And um, and they wanted to add podcasts, which was to them back then, this was in 2007, 2008, um, was a way for them to get, you know, some free content into the platform. It seemed like a fairly light lift to be able to do the technology to enable it. Um, and so they, they chose to do that before they added TV and movies and stuff, which I also worked on as well. Um, but podcasting was next on the docket. And so we, we added that. So I started building out a catalog of podcasts back then. And that was in like the 2007 to 2008 timeframe and built it out and started selling devices and, and the platform, you know, I, I think kind of sputtered along because the initial zoom that they put out was kind of like this boxy device that was actually made by Toshiba. Um, but it, it kind of had a, a negative social reaction with many of the technology evangelists out, out there that didn't like the the brown zoom. There was a lot of jokes and it caused a lot of controversy. Uh, even today, it shows up in movies and things like that and people's speeches and, and people make fun of the zoom <laughs> and point at it as like an example of Microsoft's failure. But the truth of the matter is, is that the platform was was a very compelling platform. It was really ahead of its time, as is oftentimes the case with things that Microsoft does, is they're always ahead of the market. <laughs> and so, sometimes they're not deployed in a in a way that is aligned with the market either. And I think that's one of the magic tricks that Apple's been able to pull off over the years is being able to align features and functionality with the um, social conscious mind of the market and timing has always been very, very important to Apple. Microsoft is much more of an engineering driven uh, organization, which makes it, um, they want to deploy things based on there's, there's an ability to do it and we can do it and we can force it to happen. And it may not be as attractive or it may not be as cool or, um, and it, and I think that's one of the things that you can see as a common thread across Microsoft's whole existence. I'm, I've been a big follower and fan of what, what the company has done for many, many years. And that's one of the reasons why I really went after an opportunity to, to work there. Um, and I spent seven years there and it was a fantastic experience. I mean, w working on the Zoom team was, was what, one of the best experiences that I have in my, my, my life, e even though it also had a lot of frustrations too. It was a very creative team. It actually was breaking um, barriers and and like music subscription services. It was really pioneering that, um, and it was even before Apple had that or or any of the other platforms. And actually, with that subscription, you get free tracks that you can keep. Uh, so really, nobody else was doing that back then. And so it, as we added podcasts. Um, that capability became a, a, a touch point for podcasting because it became the second largest podcast listening platform behind Apple. Uh, I think it captured, I think it, it, at the peak, it captured maybe like 20 to 25% of the podcast market um, from about uh, 2000, 
um, eight to probably 2010 or so, it, it was like in the position that Spotify is in right now in the market today. Um, and then my, Microsoft uh, decided to shut down Zune uh, to some degree, but before they did that, they actually shifted it into Xbox. And so the whole Zune experience was built into Windows Media Center and Xbox. Um, um, podcasting never made the jump to the console. Um, so I started working with uh, Windows Mobile and Windows Phone for the platform, and then also worked a little bit with the, the Windows Media Center on um, taking video podcasts, which is a, another element of podcasting, um, into that platform that people were using to watch television on big screens back in those days. And so I was curating that catalog of video podcasts, which was in the early days of the medium was about 25 to 30% of the podcasting market. Not so much now. I think we're less than probably 5% of the podcasting market is, is video podcast. That would be when I say video podcast, and this is kind of a confusing topic, but when, when I say video podcast, that is a, that is basically an MP4 file that's distributed in an RSS feed, just like the audio files are today. Um, that was a popular thing for a lot of big media companies and a lot of um, a lot of companies to put content out. And I do think that we're seeing a little bit of a resurgence in that again. But when YouTube launched in 2007, it's, it started to siphon that out of the podcasting market. People started publishing over to, to YouTube. And we, we can also talk about, if you want to, the, the development of and and how important video is today to the podcasting market. It's just not in the same way it was when podcasting started. Yeah, let, let, let's definitely get to that. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I think in our in our last conversation, I, I told you I had a, a Microsoft story. And and yeah. be, because of the times I got to meet Steve, um, he actually recruited me to be the CIO at Microsoft. And mm -hmm. um, the reason I didn't take the job for the most part was it was such a product driven organization that Very I just technical engineering driven organization. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I knew from being at Dell um, where you had 125,000 people who thought you were smarter than the internal IT, IT department, right. it was going to be much of the same. And I really wanted to get on more of the product um, right. side. So it just, uh, for me, I mean, it probably would have been a great career move, but it just didn't feel like the right move for me. But um, yeah, I was going to tell the you, company kind of kind of struggled with uh, products back then. I, I think they were primarily just making like mouses and keyboards. Um, and that's kind of what they've evolved into over the last few years with the surface um, kind of surface device that put them right in alignment with going after Apple. <laughs> yeah, so. I was. Yes, well, um, I got to experiment with many of those those um, products that you were talking about because mm -hmm. that that Zoom, I because I was initially the CIO for the consumer group at Dell. We would get all these products to try from Microsoft, and yeah. so I had one of those um, for, for a long time. But you probably have never heard this story. Um, Dell had hired a guy named uh, Ron Gerigs, and Ron claim to fame had been he he was an evp at motorola and he launched their first flip phone um, and so bell michael dell hired him to lead this consumer business and he was really taking it in a cutting edge way and we had this amazing phone um called the streak that was going to be our first mm. product to hit to hit the street and this product at the time, people said it was going to be too big, but now it's the size of the most common iPhone. But at the time, it would, would have been the biggest thing on there. And this phone was amazing. And not only did he want to do that, but he wanted to create an, a ubiquitous sound, um, cloud service brokerage underneath it so that other people could easily build apps on our platform and they would be ubiquitous to whether it was a Microsoft platform, Android, mm -hmm. or whatever he thought in the future. And um, we were going down this path and we were gonna launch with Android. And we yeah. all thought this was gonna be hugely successful. Mm -hmm. And then out of nowhere, Steve visits, has a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Michael. Um, Ron is called up to, to meet with the two of them. 
And then he comes down and goes, we're toast. He goes, Michael just made the move that we're going to launch with Microsoft and this project is dead on arrival. Oh, and uh, okay. and so literally just because of the user base of the Windows devices at that time, yeah. it just didn't have the penetration no matter mm. how good a device it was. Right. And by the time months later, we were going to move on to the Android. Unfortunately, since all this technology is made, you know, in China or Taiwan, South Korea, I, it, it all gets copied so quickly yeah. that it had already been replicated. And that whole idea that could have put Dell completely on the map was uh, lost. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So were you at Dell uh, when they made the, the Pocket PC device? I don't think I was. You are? Okay. No. That was the, yeah, I had a Dell Pocket PC. I was basically running the, the Windows software on a little I think I have it somewhere but yeah it was a great it was a great little device I, I I get this little card that I could slide into the top of it that that connected to Wi-Fi <laughs> so yeah so it was kind of cool back then and I was able to, actually I was on with my own show I was on a platform with with Microsoft back in those days um, it was called sync and go and it was a a add-on pack um, to Windows XP and it basically, I mean, from all the the functionality of it was an exact replica of what podcasting is or what podcasting developed into. And this was something that Microsoft developed back in 2003 to 2005. And my show was on and it was one of only like two or three audio shows that was on this platform. Uh, and it basically had it like a like the pocket PC docked to this docking unit that was connected to your PC via USB, and it would synchronize video and audio files to your portable your pocket PC. So you could subscribe to them in Windows XP, and it would transfer um, via this device, just like what podcasting was. So uh, Microsoft actually had podcasting before podcasting started. And I got paid. Uh, I got paid twenty five cents per transfer to a pocket PC. So it was a perfect kind of premium uh, royalty platform <laughs> for me. I was. I think I was making like five grand a month or something like that, just making my my radio show available on the Sync and Go platform. So it was, you know. So so and then podcasting um, or the Sync and Go product was actually um, dropped by Microsoft in two thousand five which was right after podcasting started. So, yeah, yeah. Just so lousy timing. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just another example of what I was trying to say earlier is that Microsoft oftentimes is, it's the same thing with the tablet, right? They, they were very early with it and it just was too early and they didn't have the right form factor and they hadn't thought through the um, social implications and the use case scenarios um, quite as well as I think Apple does. The whole major purpose of what we're trying to do on Passion Struck is to educate our listeners or watchers, if they're viewing this on YouTube, on how do you become more intentional in the direction of your life? And mm -hmm. I think you're a perfect example of this because you have kind of been in this podcast lane now um, as long as anyone has, if not longer. What I'd like to understand is how did this become kind of your life's passion? And what keeps feeding it? Well, I think it goes back to the very early days of my background and stuff. I think um, I have a marketing degree. Um, I got it back in uh, 1986. And back then, marketing was a very different um, animal than it is today. But um, that took me down this path of, of ha having an interest in uh, media, right? Um, advertising, all that kind of stuff. So that interest came from that plus just kind of consumer marketing too, which is the, a, a big part of what I was, um, my background and my education was kind of focused on, uh, on that. And I got pulled into the, the grocery industry right out of college, um, and, and started working for companies, big brands, um, on the, the, the sales side, like, uh, Chiquita brands, John Morrell, I've worked on um, um, Butterball, I've worked on Nathan's Hot Dogs, I've worked, you know, all that stuff in the grocery 
um, aisle and then spent five years working at the Florida Department of Citrus. So I huh. was I was working on uh, promoting orange juice, grapefruit juice, and fresh citrus um, up, up in the Pacific Northwest, up in Western Canada, Alaska, and Oregon, um, putting um, advertising campaigns together and and working with like Tropicana and Minute Maid and other orange juice brands and fresh fresh fruit brands to put um, integrated campaigns together that involve television, radio, um, uh, sampling in stores, working with like Costco and those folks, you know, try, trying to get products moving in the market, you know, setting up displays and stores and, and really kind of funding that. I had a, I had a, a multi-million dollar uh, marketing budget that I could spend just up in the that part of the world that was funded by a tax on the growers in Florida. So so it was a state agency. So I was working for um, my boss actually reported to the governor for 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 five years. So I was kind of representing the industry. And that's what kind of started me down this path because then I that, that was right in the time frame of two, uh, 1996 time frame 97 which was kind of the the early days of the internet right um, that's that's when net um, uh, Netscape uh, or Mozilla started to to do what they were doing and that's kind of what took me down this path and I built a website for the Florida citrus um, department I just kind of did it uh, I didn't you know that was another thing that happened a lot back in those days was people in corporations or large organizations, because the organization didn't really understand what was happening to the internet, they just did stuff right. Um, and then they had to answer for it later, but which is exactly what happened to me, because I created this whole w website up in Seattle for the Florida citrus industry, and it started to get traction. I, I, I started to give away sailboats off of the websites through sweepstakes. <laughs> I used to run billboard campaigns in the Seattle market, you know, driving people to floridajuice.com um, and trying to, you know, utilize this and do sweepstakes at the stores. And back in those days, uh, the sweepstakes were very popular in the grocery industry and then doing couponing and that kind of stuff in the stores, um, to, to, to drive attention to my, my campaigns. So this whole website started me down this path. And I, I worked with a website development agency in Seattle to build this out and, and it started to grow and be, became kind of a national impact thing um and the the leadership back in florida and the florida citrus commission started to see things happening <laughs> that um maybe they didn't fully grasp the implications of and they they wound up having kind of like a like what the heck is going on up in seattle <laughs> kind of a reaction to me so i i had this call with the executive director of the organization and he, he basically um was, you know, had a million questions for me because the Florida Citrus Commission was like, what is this guy? What are, what are they doing up there? They seem to be getting a lot of attention. Um, so, so anyway, so that was my experience with it too, is just, I just did stuff. And, and that's what kind of pulled me down this path of getting involved in realizing that the internet and the web was going to be just such a powerful marketing vehicle. Um, and that took me down a different path here. And then I, I wound up consulting with um, smaller companies up in the Seattle area, um, and helping them, um, do search engine optimization and marketing and things like that. And that's what pulled me down this path. And I started this radio show, um, trying to drive more clients and drive, drive more awareness of the kind of things that I was working on, on the marketing side. And what I learned from building the floridajuice.com website and, um, marketing that and seeing what the impact was of it. And so I just walked into a radio station in the Seattle market and said, are you doing a show on technology? And they said, no. And I said, well, I'll do one. How do I get started? So I, I rounded up some of my friends and went in and did it. And that took me down this path. And this was back in February of 1999 is when this all came down and started doing the show. I was horrible at it at the beginning. Actually, you can go to my my blog that makes two uh, of us <laughs> right <laughs> makes I, two of us <laughs> yeah i mean I, I wasn't a very good speaker back then um and i just it wasn't something that was a big part of my life i i wasn't a broadcaster i didn't come from radio so i didn't have that education or background at all it's just something that i saw it as a marketing opportunity because i saw it as like um, content is what i learned from the website is content is 
a way to market as well. So content marketing is kind of an accepted thing now, but back in those days, uh, it wasn't. Um, you know, utilizing this new medium to reach people in a different way and to try and digitize those relationships was something that was kind of still new. You know, it wasn't something that very many people were doing or understood. Even the organization that I worked for didn't understand what I was doing. Um, so, so, but quickly they embraced it and, and they took it over for me. I just said, yeah, you can have it. And it, they turned it over to an agency and, and they took it from there. And then um, after that, I built the world's largest glass of orange juice and, and, and set a Guinness Book World Records, which also kind of set everybody on a tailspin back there too, because uh, that got all sorts of media attention and, um, and, and things like that too. So that's how I got into it. And then I just got sucked into the technology more and more as the internet developed beyond 1997 and, and on and started working for, I left the Florida Citrus Commission to go, go to work for a startup company that was doing photography, um, it, doing kind of digital photography around photo gifts. So I spent a couple of years working for a company like that that I work with like Kodak and, and um, uh, I, I can't even remember, I can um, Snapfish and other large companies out there, Walmart and things like that around photo gifts. And so that was another part of the digitization experience that I, I had working for other companies. And then through that whole time I was working, I was doing the radio show and, and, and growing that. And that's what got me into this. Well, you and I have another similarity that I didn't realize <laughs> as, as I was in the epicenter of the digital coupon or when they started the paper coupon because yep. I was with Catalina Marketing. So ah, very, yeah, I'm familiar um, with Catalina Marketing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if a listener isn't familiar with it, they at one time had the largest database of personalized offers kind of in that CPG pharmacy mass grocery world. So yep. on one side sits all the CPG companies and on the other side was every single grocery and mass retailer, but Walmart and CVS. So I think I actually worked with Catalina marketing a few times with all those jobs that I was at. It wanted to be the Florida Citrus Commission and all the meat company roles that I had too back then. So yeah, it, they were a big player in the couponing space back then. I remember. They were massive. I never thought of a paper printer network being an ad distribution network, but that was exactly it. And yeah. just like uh, other ad networks, you could fill up that pipe in many different ways. Yeah. Um, but interesting. <laughs> So, yeah, I had coupons that were on, on the, the website that I built for the Florida Citrus Commission that you could print off. And then I also had recipes. And so that was part of the background of this whole thing was trying to give people, a, you know, a way to transact. Right. And if you can give them a coupon through this methodology, the truth about coupons is, is that you can distribute 100 million coupons, but only like 2% will ever get used. So it's usually more marketing benefit than it is on conversion benefit, but. <laughs> I'm taking us off this intentionality uh, phase now because I, I can't have you on this show and not uh, speak or ask about some of your podcast wisdom. If you're a listener of the show and you might listen to podcasts, but you don't really know what's going on in the industry, what is the state right now of podcasting and where do you see things going over the next 18 to 24 months? Well, I think clearly the podcasting market is maturing because you think about what's been happening, Amazon entering the space, Spotify, Sirius XM, iHeartRadio, you just go through the the list of all of the, the big companies. Um, Samsung's now in the space. Um, Google is all in. Obviously, Apple has been involved for, for many years. Um, and and I think the real big impact is a, a company like Amazon um, getting involved in the space. And then also we're seeing a lot of companies outside of the U.S. really start to jump into it. It's not all about the U.S. A anymore in podcasting. So we're starting to see these acquisitions happen outside of the U.S. as well. Uh, I know um, podcasting is expanding in Asia and big, big huge countries like the country of India is expanding. There's a billion people over there. So it's, it's just huge. So, so I think that's the big thing is the, the globalization of the medium is taken off. And it's also the professionalization of the medium. 
Um, podcasting at its core has primarily always been kind of like an independent creator medium. Um, but we're seeing more and more um, the influence of these larger companies um, changing that to some degree. Um, I think the key takeaway, though, is that they will change it to some degree, but the open nature of what how podcasting is built uh, on RSS um, will keep it um, a fairly open medium. Uh, I, I don't believe any company is going to be able to really dominate it um, as much as I think Apple has been able to, to do um, today. I think if anything, it's going to be more balanced out. Spotify is taking share away from Apple um, as far as uh, listeners, but the truth about Spotify is that the people that they um, bring to the platform to listen to podcasts are not listening to as much content as users that use the Apple platform. So there may be as many or more people that are using podcasts on Spotify as on Apple, but generally those users don't use as much content or listen to as much content as those that use Apple. So you kind of always have to keep that on. And it, you'll see in the news, it, 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 it'll be spun up like Spotify is now bigger than Apple or that they have more users or whatever. And that implies that they're bigger um, but they're really not. Um, Apple is probably, you know, four or five to one um, on actual downloads of episodes um, per user. So it's it's a it, it depends on how you slice the cake. But um, I think the, the other big trend that's happening right now is um, monetization. I think as the audience, and I felt this way for many years, as the overall audience, listening audience, should grows in podcasting, the monetization opportunities um, should correspond and grow as well. And I think we're starting to see the beginnings of that around what's called programmatic advertising, which is more um, auction based, more automatic buys that get um, you buy on a platform as a brand and then you run the campaigns and it automatically goes into podcasts um, based on that genre fill. And and you can run real-time campaigns and podcasts, which has always been able to be done in streaming radio. Um, but the the past with podcasting has been mostly host reads, uh, which have been baked into the content, which are very labor intensive and costly and slow to traffic and to to create you know frequency. It takes a lot of labor, and that's what's driven a lot of that activity. The host reads into big shows, and that's what where a lot of the, the revenue is today is on the on the host read side, it still is, um, because the the CPMs, and that's the, the fee that's paid per thousand listeners, um, has always been the highest with baked in host reads. Because guess what, you know, you, you bake it into the content, it's always there, right? So even though an advertiser comes in and buys a campaign, um, they know that that ad is gonna remain in the content uh, forever. Um, is what the assumption is. And so they're willing to pay a little extra for that. But with programmatic, that's more of a, like a dynamic insertion, removal, replacement type of a model, and which has a little bit lower CPM. But it's also gathering steam because it's, it's enabling, because of the automation, to uh, traffic uh, campaigns across larger numbers of shows. And uh, though the CPMs are, are less, uh, but that's, 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 a big area as well. And then there's premium and you're starting to see this with, um, you know, the acquisition of like a Wondery or whatever by, by Amazon as well. And, and you're seeing Audible getting into the space as well, more and more, that's more around premium content. And we're, we're starting to see that area start to develop too, as we see studios out of Hollywood start to produce higher production quality type of productions, um, more fictional stuff. Um, the true crime genre has taken off and done very well, and that continues to accelerate out there as a popular genre, mainly, I hate to say this, but mainly to women. W w women are the largest consumers of true crime podcasts. Um, so it's a ponderous thing to think about of why that's the case, but, um, but it's, it, it's interesting. So I think those are the big things that are happening in podcasting, and I think it's going to continue to grow. I think that there's also a likelihood that we may have, we may be approaching a plateau in growth of podcasting in the U.S. Uh, because we're starting to reach a maturation point in, in the development and any growth will probably continue, but it will slow a little bit. 
Um, and I think the growth outside of the U.S. will will accelerate. Yes, well, I've, I've only been doing this for a year, so right. no nowhere close to, to what you have. But as I was thinking about getting in it, I can't tell you how many people um, told me not to do it. Uh, oh, because, really? Wow, interesting. Yeah. Well, it, well, if you think about it, it is harder than you think to break into um, if you yeah. want because I didn't start getting sponsors until, you know, I could show I was getting 20,000 downloads a week. Well, I and, mean, I, I mean, you can get campaigns probably at a lower level, um, but is it worth it at the, at that point? Right. I mean, I think at the other end of the spectrum is, is what's the CPM trade-off. I mean, if you're getting paid per thousand and you're getting 5,000, it's it, that CPM times five is what you're looking at. But if you can get up to a higher number, then it becomes, some real money at that point, right? Yes, well, what was interesting is I, I heard Jordan Harbinger, who's probably one of the, the biggest podcasters there is. Yeah, I know um, on a friend, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was on a friend of mine's show and um, yep. my friend Adam Posner said, if you were to say something to someone thinking about getting into podcasting, what would you say? And he goes, don't do it. Yeah, I know, Jordan's been saying that for years. <laughs> um, I just think to me, um, if you're going to get into it, do it for the right reasons and make sure yeah. that you have a passion for it. Because my experience is it is a heck of a lot more work than I ever thought it would be. And it's yep. really, I think what makes a good podcaster compared to a, a mediocre one is you really have to be consistent. You constantly have to be looking out there at the trends. How do you make the show better? How do you become mm -hmm. better? How do you yep. research? What different angles? And so for me, it's just this constant rethinking about what I'm doing all the time. And can we change yep. it up? Can we make it better? Because you want to do what everyone else is doing. Right. Yeah, um, I think it's a lot like starting a business, right? I, I, I think at the end of the day, it's, you know, you have to think about your strategy. You have to think about how you approach the market. You have to think about um, dedication, consistency. Um, follow through, making promises and, and following through with those with, and in, in this case, it's your listeners. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's a serious endeavor. There's no question. And I think that's the biggest thing that I spend a lot of time myself when I work with podcasters is helping them cut through the, the, the noise that's around that because uh, it can be very confusing with the myriad. It's almost like walking into a grocery store, right? And, and, and having, you know, 10, 10 different or 40 different brands of toilet paper, which one do you buy? It's, I mean, to some degree, that's the case with podcasting too, is it, you know, like what mic to get and what, you know, what platform to host it on, or do I need to be in all the listening platforms? I mean, it, it just, the, the questions are longer um, than, than a lot of people have time for and, and how you focus what you're doing uh, and how it aligns with, other parts of your life because I mean, there's a huge amount of people that start these things and quit like seven, 10 episodes into it because they either run out of something to talk about or they run out of time or life gets in the way or they it's not aligned with their bigger life strategy and it just doesn't fit. And it, you know, it, there's a lot of things that can cause somebody to stop doing this. And I'm sure you probably went through that a little bit of that too, questioning what you were doing when you got started too. After 10, 15 episodes and you're not seeing the traction and you're because you think you're going to put this out to the world and you're overnight going to have thousands of views. You think even your family and friends are going to support you with giving you five star ratings and none of it happens. <laughs> so it really becomes, you know, you got to check your ego and just right. make sure that what you're doing here is to serve a greater purpose than yourself. And I think if the audience isn't familiar with this, the other big thing that I, I don't think people understand is there's really two camps in podcasting. There's independent podcasters like myself, mm -hmm. Lewis Howes, yep. Jordan, Impact Theory. And then a lot of these podcasts that you're listening to are syndicated under a kind of an umbrella like, the, mm -hmm. like Dave Ramsey has probably eight or nine podcasts under his brand. Yep. And Dave Ramsey's brand owns the content, not the host of the show. And so that's the trade-off yep. between the two. But when you're win with one of those groups, you also have the advantage of them being able to throw a lot more dollars and to use the other shows to cross-pollinate cross and, right. and promote, mm -hmm. which for me, 
and we're going to talk about your show here in a second, I'm a huge believer that none of us are really competing with each other because there's so many out there. So the more we can collaborate and help other podcasters out, to me, I think is a, is a big win for everyone because just like your show, your message needs to hit someone. Mine does too. And if we can introduce our messages to our audiences, then everyone gets better. Is kind yeah. of my philosophy. Yeah. So on that note, uh, you have a podcast. Um, you host it with a fellow podcast uh, Hall of Famer, Todd Cochran. And mm-hmm. I was hoping that you could talk about your podcast, um, what it's about, and where the future is going with yours. Well, that show started um, a little over 10 years ago, back when I was working at Microsoft, actually. Um, and, and Todd uh, was doing his Geek New Central podcast that he was doing, and we were collaborating <clears throat> because that was in the time when I was at the tail end of my, my, my tenure with the Web Talk radio show, which I had actually worked with Todd when I was doing that show as well. I had a streaming servers. So I was doing a lot of streaming back in those days of my show. And so I, I put on a bunch of Todd's shows on, because he built a podcast network back in 2005. And so I was streaming those shows. So he would upload the, the show episodes to my server and then I would stream that for him. And, and so, so we, we started working together way before we were competitors. So like I worked for Lipson, the original podcast hosting platform to ever exist. He runs a platform called Blueberry Podcasting, which is also a podcast hosting platform that also has the PowerPress plugin for WordPress that actually enables podcasting through the WordPress platform. And, and so we started do, just doing this show day. It was called the Saturday Morning Tech Show. And so we, we, I started showing up on Saturday mornings. Um, that was my habit because I was actually doing that with my radio show. I did, did that show um, live on Saturday mornings for years. And so that Saturday morning routine of me doing a show was something that I continued. And so I just did it with him. And, and over a period of years, it uh, transitioned. I, I just mentioned on the show one day, well, Todd, we keep talking about podcasting. We should probably change the name of the show from Saturday morning tech show to like the new media show or something like that. And so that became the the name of the show. And and so we made the transition. You can see the the, the logo behind us. And, and so that, that show's just been steadily something growing. It it's always was a live show. It was a live audio and on demand um, video and audio program. So it was an audio and video podcast. So it was distributed as an RSS feed. There's separate RSS feeds, one for the audio file, one for the video file that you can subscribe to in Apple Podcasts. Um, and then it's also live streamed on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch. Um, and, um, what's the other one? I think those are the main ones, but I think he, he's pushing it out to a couple others, new ones out there. But um, so it's just something we do every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, noon Pacific. Uh, and that's we talk about the growth and development of what's happening in the podcasting industry primarily, but we also spend time talking about overall new media too. Um, and it, I keep asking this question, at what point is this medium that we're doing here uh, considered not new anymore? Um, but I think until, I, I don't know what that point is, but I, I think there's still people out there where it's still relatively new. So I think we'll keep the name until the situation, I don't know if that's 30 years or however long that is, but, um, but so, so what we have on this show is, that, you know, it's Todd and I usually just talking about the, the trends and the, the, the latest news and the developments in the industry. And we get a little um, retrospective about the medium at times because of our long duration. Todd started podcasting back in 2004 as well. And so, so we just both have a common kind of experience base and I know him like the back of my hand. Um, any topic comes up, I can probably answer, you know, the question or the, the comment for him because I've seen him talk about things so many times. So there's a strong chemistry there. And I think there's a takeaway from that too. If you're going to co-host something with somebody, chemistry is a huge component of um, success because and personalities need to be different too. Um, I've learned that in the two podcasts that I've done. I also did a show called the Spreaker Live Show, and this was back when I worked for Spreaker. I did did like uh, 
200 plus episodes of that show too. And that was a live show as well. Um, and, and just the kind of camaraderie that exists between co-hosts um, and, uh, and people like one co-host more than another typically. So you're basically, if you have different personalities, you can bring different energy to the show. I, I tend to be seen as kind of like the calm, cool and collected dude on the show. And Todd is seen as a little bit of the, the firebrand. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you never know what's going to come out of his mouth type of a situation. And I had that same type of relationship with my co-host for my speaker live show too. So you, you have to create kind of a, a magic in the show that's appealing to different types of personalities. And I think it's podcasting is a psychological game too. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and it's a hard thing to teach someone. Um, you know, I think having years and years on microphone uh, in all sorts of different situations really trains you to be able to adapt very quickly. And, and that's what this show has done for me for many years is really caused me to really kind of, become even a stronger live uh, podcaster or media creator. Um, and I, I'm, a, I'm just a lot more comfortable and it's turned me into being a much better public speaker too. And I, you know, go do keynotes or go, go speak at a conference or lead a panel or, or just do zoom calls too. I mean, it, all, these skills are transferable. And I think that's one of the big takeaways I, I think from the last two years is that it's a lot of people that got forced into this that I had already spent years building this. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I, I tend to go on a little long. <laughs> no, I, I know it does. And, and I will tell you, for me, I really enjoy these uh, interviews that I get to do. Um, I also do a solo episode and yeah. I will tell you, I've already come up with the next 60 topics, yeah. but I still have to research and deliver them. So it's like almost... I mean, I guess for the audience in this light, I, every week am having to develop, if you go to church, it'd be like a new sermon, or if you're a yeah. keynote speaker, I have to develop a, a brand new 15 to 20 minute keynote every single week that has to be well-researched. So yeah. there's yeah. a lot behind the scenes that uh, people just don't get to see. Yeah. I have a question for you on that too, um, because this is something that I wrestle with, with the new media show is that. What we found in the data is that the shows that just have Todd and I in them um, tend to get more downloads than the shows that I bring on a guest. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, I've had like the the folks that are working on the Facebook podcast platform be guests on the show before. And, and that was a popular episode, but um, the week after that Facebook episode, we actually saw a big bump in, when it was just Todd and I. So it's caused me to think about interviews in a different way. Um, I think the interviews need to be additive, um, not a replacement for you <laughs> um, as the host. Um, and that's kind of what I kind of, I kind of wonder about sometimes. So I think it's smart that you're doing some solo episodes, but it'd be interesting to see what the data shows for, for you. Are those more popular than your interviews? So I've got the answer for you. Um, you do. So I have, I guess through my research, and I probably spent a good year researching and literally listening to hundreds of episodes to look at different styles, to see what other people were doing before I jumped in, into the game. Um, yeah. Because I think you've got to really practice before you're going to come out there and do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think at the end of the day, people... I go and listen to Jay Shetty's podcast because yeah. I like Jay Shetty. Right, um, exactly, yeah. He could have President Obama on there or Michelle Obama, and he might get a few more listeners because of them. Mm -hmm. But generally people are coming there already because they like the way he asks them questions and the insights right. he shares along with it. So what I have found that um, has been very surprising is with the exception of a couple episodes. And for me, some of the biggest name people I've had on underwhelmed in audience. Um, whereas people who don't have any sh social tread at all have performed extremely well. And I think it's because right. pe people like their stories and they share them. But yeah. overall, um, I'm, I'm getting probably 25 to 30% more downloads 
on my own individual episodes yep. than I am on the interviews. Yeah, that's what I found with our show too. And it's, it's not that I don't like to do interviews and I do, um, but it needs to be additive and it needs to be contextual to the, the, the goals of the show. And that's, that's what I tend to do. It's like, that's why I had the Facebook, the Facebook podcast people on, on the shows, because that's additive to the conversation. That's information that wouldn't have come from us because I'm either under NDA or, <laughs> or right. whatever it is, right? It's a way to get around kind of the structural limitations that, that I have around content. Um, so if you're a podcaster and um, you want to start a show that's kind of doing like what you're doing here, here, John, and what I'm doing with the new media show is uh, it can be powerful to have a, a co-host too, that you have a real strong, you know, collaborative way of thinking about things and can create real conversation on the, on the show. But being a solo caster is not easy too, as you'll probably, you know, I think you would probably agree with that. Um, trying to hold the attention of an audience. And this is where the big <clears throat> talk, talk radio show hosts really uh, earn their money. Um, those that do three hours of live um, solo, um, trying to hold an audience and hold their attention and be able to hold it from coming back from break and doing all this kind of stuff like that is a, is a skill that not burn people have, you know, and it's, yes. yeah, I have a lot of respect yeah. for those guys. <laughs> well, God rest his soul, but like him or hate him, Rush Limbaugh was like a master at it. I know um, he was, he was, he, he was would very just good. keep you hooked. <laughs> He's constantly telling a story and he has a view and he'll share it and it can be a, politically divisive, but that was, that was the game, right? That was definitely the game. Well, one last question for you before we wrap up and earlier you touched on kind of the evolution of video and how video was going to impact podcasting and that I've, I've actually by mistake uploaded my MP4 instead of putting the MP3 in there. And, and then, you know, the episode goes live and I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> So, um, so I've done it unintentionally, but I do the thing where I post my episodes, and then I, I chop them up and I make them into micro videos, but all that goes on YouTube. Um, but wh where do you see things going on the video front? Oh, I think that the, clearly the video side of things is accelerating in importance. <clears throat> you know, I think I've, I've become here over the last year, a, a pretty avid consumer of content on YouTube. It's, it's really replaced most of my TV viewing, um, mostly on a big screen. Um, so I'm finding that I can get more depth um, into topics over there. Um, and I'm seeing more podcasters um, move that direction. Now, granted, video, like I was talking about earlier about my, my work on the Windows Media Center and and video podcasting in the very early days of, of podcasting, it was a different kind of content over there around around video podcasting. So now we're seeing shows like what we're doing because of platforms like StreamYard and uh, Riverside FM and and um, Zoom um, are are enabling a different kind of video podcasting. One that's probably more pure to what podcasting is, um, but it's also important to the visual element more more than ever. Uh, I, I think most of us, you know, especially when I started with the new media show, it was very geeky. You can see I have this big microphone here and yes. it's very kind of geeky, but I've, you know, I've added colored lights behind me now and I've added these, these, you know, picture frame stuff on the wall to add a little more pizzazz to my background and the experience of it. And I, I, I have studio lights now and I've got all that stuff where I didn't have that stuff in the early days but I did have high quality microphone, right? So now I've got a teleprompter, so I can actually look at you right into the teleprompter and look right at the camera because the camera is right behind the teleprompter. Um, I don't always do that because I've got a screen in front of me that's bigger than my teleprompter, so my eyes get pulled down to that. But, but, um, but yeah, I think video, and I, I'm gonna up my game with video too. I'm gonna. I bought a new home and I'm going to move over there and part of my house, I'm going to convert into a kind of a video studio. And so, because I want to up my game on the video side too, because I'm also in the middle of trying to launch my own new podcast. It's called spoken life. And it's going to be about, you know, audio, um, not just podcasting, but about the importance of audio. 
Um, but video is going to be an important part of that for me as well. So I think what you're doing here, I mean, I mean, your background is very visual. It's cool. It's very clean. Uh, I think it's, it's what the market is looking for now. And I think um, more and more, it's about the topics. It's about the focus of the topics. I don't know what you get gravitated towards on, 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 on YouTube, but you can really see the kind of content creators that are really excelling over there. And they're, they are taking a little bit more of an extreme position on everything. You know, it's like, I follow a lot of investing and a lot of real estate um, type of topic shows over there. And, and they're always talking about crashes and they're always get, got, got the visuals on the thumbnails of them with the weird faces on with the big splashing graphics and things like that. It's almost like the old days of the, the, the banner advertising that was in the early days of um, the, 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 the web with the motion graphics and all that kind of stuff that was out there or the billboards or whatever. So it's, a, it's just an interesting phenomenon what's happening over there. And, and video is so interesting. And there's no reason why if you're a video creator over there, they can't be an audio podcaster too. So that's an element that I'm working on too, is trying to attract those folks that are successful on YouTube over to become, take that audio and put it out as a podcast. So. Yes, I, and I would have to say I'm on the same lines. I'm I'm doubling down on getting better at video production. I'm also looking at turning a bedroom into a whole video studio. Um, I have a 2,500 square foot studio I have access to as well, um, and I want to get a lot more into uh, live shows. I purposely didn't do it over this first year um, because I I just wanted to stay very focused at you know, getting comfortable doing high quality podcasts. And I felt after that, because you never know during an interview, especially if it's, if it's live, um, what you might run into during a discussion. Um, so I wanted to make sure I got really comfortable uh, doing these. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's compelling. And I think, uh, you know, as you think about kind of the technology evolution that's happening too, I think eventually we will have autonomous cars um, that will drive themselves. And, and I think we'll be more and more reliant on that. And guess what that presents is opportunity to watch video while you're in your car. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, I mean, already the Tesla cars have, have like entertainment systems built into them now. So they're totally preparing for this new, new phase of media consumption in, in our transportation devices. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's where things are going. And I think audio is going to continue to become important too, because there's just so many more places that you can consume audio than you can video. And that will always make audio a compelling thing to do as well. Yes, I agree. Well, Rob, you've been so generous with your time. Um, and I know you are for many, many people who are in the podcasting community. So thank you for being so giving. Um, and if a listener was interested in learning more about you, um, I'll put this in the show notes, but I always like to give the guest a chance to put their uh, information okay. out there as well. Yeah, I think the best way to reach me, if you're a Twitter user, I'm on Twitter as well, at Rob Greenlee. I'm on Facebook, the Instagram platform, LinkedIn, all of the major ones. I've been on there for many, many years. And um, I do have a YouTube channel, but it's not fully developed yet. And um, and, but I can also be found on my own website, robgreenlee.com. Um, and that's um, G-R-E-E-N-L-E-E, -E -E, so last name. And if you want to send me an email, you're more than welcome to do that too. You can send it to uh, robg at lipson.com. Uh, if you wanted to reach out to me, if you had a question or, uh, or you just wanted to contact me, I, I purposely put my information out completely. Um, I don't like to hide um, so th there's, that's just kind of a philosophy that I have. People have always been very respectful of, uh, reaching out. Um, and, and it's just so many opportunities that you, 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 you may be giving up by not putting yourself out there. Right. Okay. Well, Rob, thank you so much thank for being you. on the show. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me on. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did that interview with Rob Greenlee. What a pioneer in the podcasting space and a great mentor to anyone out there who is launching or well into their podcasting career. Now, if you're new to the show or you would just like to introduce it, 
to a friend or family member, we now have episode starter packs on both Spotify and the Passion Struck website. These are collections of your favorite episodes organized by topic, which gives any new listener a great way to get acquainted to everything that we do here on the show. Just go to passionstruck.com slash starter packs to get started. And in addition to listening to these podcast episodes, if you'd prefer to watch them and also see some short clips from the show, you can go to our YouTube channel at John R. Miles, where we have over 270 different videos. Please go there and subscribe. And lastly, if you truly love today's episode or the show in general, we always appreciate a five-star rating. We now have over 4,800 of them, and it creates such a viral impact for the popularity of this show. I hope you were able to learn something from today's episode. Now go out there and live life passion struck. Thank you so much for joining us. The purpose of our show is to make passion go viral. And we do that by sharing with you the knowledge and skills that you need to unlock your hidden potential. If you want to hear more, please subscribe to the Passion Struck podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts at. And if you absolutely love this episode, We'd appreciate a five-star rating on iTunes and you sharing it with three of your most growth-minded friends so they can post it as well to their social accounts and help us grow our Passion Struck community. If you'd like to learn more about the show and our mission, you can go to passionstruck.com where you can sign up for our, our newsletter, look at our tools, and also download the show notes for today's episode. Additionally, you can listen to us every Tuesday and Friday for even more inspiring content. And remember, make a choice, work hard, and step into your sharp edges. Thank you again for joining us. 